Okay, we're back live inside theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE.com. This is theCUBE, our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. Uh, this is an independent media operation in theCUBE, SiliconANGLE.tv, in partnership with our analyst team, Wikibon.org, um, Dave Vellante, who's with me here, uh, uh, to summarize and talk about news around the web and give our opinion and analysis of what's going on in the tech business and, and general business and tech, and uh, we want to bring that to you. We would not be able to, to exist if it wasn't for our great uh, underwriters and supporters of, the, of our mission at theCUBE, and that's uh, IBM here at IBM Edge. Um, so watch their ads and watch our ads of our sponsors because we are ad supported. And that funds the independent analysis. Our goal is to get the signal from the noise and share that with you. We're here at IBM Edge. Dave, uh, what do you think so far about the IBM Edge event and uh, what's happening out of the first morning segments? Well, John, this is obviously a storage event, but I think you cannot talk about an IBM Edge storage event without talking about IBM, the company. Uh, IBM is a you know, hundred plus billion dollar company in terms of revenue, uh, and it's got a, over a $200 billion market cap, so it's trading at over two times revenue, which is quite impressive for a company that's largely known for its services, but IBM's investment in software has paid off considerably. Contrast that, John, with Hewlett Packard. It's a $120 billion revenue company, and it's trading at about 30 cents on the revenue dollar, and um, it's, a, it's a stark contrast. So, you know, maybe you know IBM is high, maybe HP is low. I don't know, but there's there are two behemoths in the industry on two completely different vectors. IBM is like a battleship. You know, it's just it, it, when it moves, it moves very slowly, um, but they have a lot of power. Um, the company, you know, is a great company. IBM is uh, professional. I mean, we heard some of the guests here on this morning, articulate. They know their stuff. They're professional. IBM is a, is a great company, and they're fantastic. I mean, it's, it's East Coast. It's New York based. It's, uh, it's kind of like the Apple of the East Coast, it's, it's, but it's not as flashy, but they have a lot of meat on the bone, as we always say. So very impressed with IBM in general as a company. Uh, one thing that's very lacking with IBM that I would say is that their marketing is very weak um, at, at, the, at the solution level. I mean, they do a lot of you know, global marketing. You go and watch the Tiger Woods golf tournaments and whatnot, you see Smarter Planets. Great so brand marketing. Great brand marketing, yeah. but you know, in a solutional area like storage, where it's so strategic, Dave, um, and there's so much change going on, they don't have a lot of that marketing, but their story's come, kind of coming together. So, so that's kind of a criticism of the past, but I see this show as IBM moving out of that, um, you know, speeds and feeds, storage only conversation to a much broader portfolio, as Ed Wall said. And I think that's really smart. Um, the customers that they t sell to buy from IBM from different divisions. So I think that coordination message that the new CEO, uh, Janine, is bringing to the table is very strong. And I think if they can pull that together and amplify that story and create that umbrella messaging across the different business units, I think they're going to have a winner because they got the packages there. Yeah, I think you're, if you're a partner of IBM, you know, channel partner or, or a solution provider, you know, on the one hand, you're concerned because it's a complex organization. On the other hand, you're excited because of the massive install base that IBM has. So what, what I see happening at, at Edge is IBM is reaching out to its both customer and partner communities <clears throat> and it's reaffirming its commitment, you know, not only to the IBM you know, solutions oriented approach, but specifically to storage. And it's, as we've been talking about all morning, trying to get its, uh, its storage mojo back. Well, I'm going to be giving a talk um, to a couple hundred uh, of IBM's business partners, executive partners, um, system integrators, channel partners, and, and whatnot tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to talk about what we mentioned earlier, the four horsemen of, of disruption within IT transformation, which is cloud, um, mobile, social, and big data. And um, you know, that really is the, the ground zero of what's happening with the change right now. And you know, we, we talk about Facebook going public a couple weeks ago and everyone's watching that kind of as a bellwether of the future, stock's down right now. But I'm bullish on Facebook going, going forward. But Facebook represents a new generation of infrastructure. And I think the story coming out of IBM Edge here is a, is a um, validation to our analysis and coverage over the past two years with theCUBE around cloud, mobile, and social, but more importantly, that fundamental business opportunities are going to be shaped by the intersection of business requirements and IT solutions. Not just a passing needs back to IT and having that being serviced, a real intersection of the two. We heard from um, IBM's uh, youngest VP ever uh, earlier, and she said that you know, these, these big data requests are coming from business line managers, not IT. So that to me is fundamentally a trend that's been validated. 
I think IBM's direction with the battleship that's pointing in the direction of the marketplace, they're going right down the right track. Yeah, and you look at a company like SAP, we were at Sapphire three weeks ago, and you know, clearly SAP has that strategy, selling into the line of business. You mentioned the Facebook uh, IPO. I, you know, I as well was very bullish on that. I, I think I miscalculated. I mean, I thought that Facebook would be the next wave. You know, we saw Netscape, we saw Google. I thought Facebook was going to lift all tides. What I miscalculated, John, was the degree to which Facebook was going to price that IPO, and, and frankly, you know, overprice that IPO. And most IPOs come out at maybe in you know, the low teens, maybe the mid teens. Good ones come out in the high teens. Maybe you know every now and then you'll see one come out in the low 20s, pricing it at 38. Was it? Um, I think the markets had a little backlash, and since then, you know we've seen the exact opposite effect as to what I thought would happen. Um, now, of course, a lot of that, of course, is Europe, you know, dragging on the market. Um, but a number of companies have pulled back their IPOs and are, are really rethinking the public markets right now. And um, you, know, you know, I'm know, hoping it's short-lived, but I'm not so sure. Well, no, I think IBM's going to be fine. I mean, there's no problem. There's no doubt in my mind from a performance standpoint, business fundamentals, they're going to do well. The, the challenge that you brought up earlier was how can they balance profitability in the short term and long term positioning. And I think you're hearing that investment. Um, but it's an exciting time. I think what's happening right now, Dave, is that fundamentally at a, on a global scale, open source technology, lower cost um, MIPS, uh, computing power and storage and networking converging together is creating literally the perfect storm of innovation and disruption where new solutions and new use cases are coming out. Um, and we're covering that. It, it, even in the news, you know, related to that, uh, new, new possibilities are emerging. Good and bad, bad being, the way I look at it, um, I just tweeted about war games, right? War games is happening. We have, for the first time in our history, cyber war officially sanctioned by the government. And today in the uh, New York Times, again, another story about cyber weapons warning, cyber war warning. So, so there's a warning, but it's already happened. It's like a tornado that's touched ground. Um, you know, so that is a real change to how we operate our society and our government but ultimately that's the same for businesses days. Big data, big data is that, that theme, it's that hype term, it's that categorical description for uh, the complete transformation of all the value activities within these, these businesses um, from how they, they build products, how they acquire customers, and how they service them. Productivity enhancements are changing. Big data is really a productivity uh, boom for the marketplace, and we haven't seen that kind of productivity since the PC industry when the whole idea of putting productivity in the hands of the people. And I think the big difference between now and, you know, when we, when we watched the PC industry, we saw a major structural shift in the industry where the industry went from largely competing like IBM had at the time with the vertical integration strategy to one where uh, competition occurred on individual layers of the value chain. Intel dominated chips, Seagate dominated disk drives, you know, EMC came out and did its thing with storage, Oracle with databases, et cetera, IBM and services. <clears throat> and now we've seen that industry recoalesce, reconsolidate, and you really have five or six major companies that are controlling the chessboard. I've called it an oligopoly many times. <clears throat> IBM is one of those companies, but essentially it's IBM, HP, Oracle, uh, uh, I guess I would put SAP and EMC in there, but certainly Microsoft and Cisco and Intel. And those guys control the chessboard. So John, what I'm saying is to your point about big data, it's the next inflection point. These companies, you can use their cash reserves. I mean, IBM's got $12 billion in, uh, of cash on the balance sheet. Um, Cisco's got cash, Intel, Microsoft. They can use their balance sheets to acquire where they have holes in the portfolio. And so, unlike the PC era where companies like DG and Wang got totally head faked and got blown away, these existing oligopoly whales, these, these behemoths, are I think much, much smarter and have many more resources, not the least of which is its large customer base, to respond to these industry trends. And it's almost like, John, when you have two arm wrestlers, you know, and they're of equal strength. And, and you know, one can't beat the other, but they stay in the middle. And I think that's what you have. You have a, a balance of power in the industry. On the one hand, I think that's very good for customers. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes it's bad for innovation, but that's why we have such a vibrant startup community, of course, in Silicon well, Valley. Well, also, and, the M&A &A, &A market is hot, too. My news hitting today that the deal's confirmed that Salesforce.com uh, is buying Buddy Media for uh, $689 million in cash and, and stock. Um, and uh, what's interesting is, is that that's a great example of Salesforce.com retooling to get a position in the growing 
changing dynamics around social CRM, social everything, right? So, so obviously they're retooling. Salesforce is really not in a position yet to deliver the kind of scale that IBM does, for example, but they're, they're, they're changing. And I think that is a, an indication that the, the complete reconfiguration of the architecture of infrastructure, which powers the application market, is all centered around data. And this changes everything, privacy, compliance, solutions, uh, mobility at the edge. Advertising. The advertising. <laughs> Talk um, about Buddy Media, who is Buddy Media? Is uh, Buddy Media is a, a <laughs> startup that grew around social infrastructure. Um, they started a little bit before the social media trend, so they kind of backed into providing fan, fan page support, um, YouTube fan page support, but really smaller in comparison from a functionality standpoint than a company that we've been following on, on uh, the uh, SiliconANGLE called This Moment. As you know, when we see a company we like, we, we like to ride that horse. Like, like Millennial Media. So this moment is super hot. Right? Thismoment.com is probably the best uh, social infrastructure company. Uh, it's called thismoment.com, and what this moment does is they power social infrastructure for the largest brands. Hunger Games and films, like Hunger Games, they made a huge success, but it's not about a marketing gimmick. They are actually powering with complex technology and solutions to actually provide infrastructure so that marketing people can, can run targeted ad campaigns using social channels through a diverse set of content types. So the old days of advertising are changing where you had a copy strategy and you had a campaign, and you might have had a few versions of that campaign for the different demographics and psychographics, but now with the web, the way it is, you can target people down to thousands of different campaigns going simultaneously. That's really hard to execute on. And then having the analytics behind it, that's what this moment does. So Buddy Media selling is really a good call for them. I think it's a great move, because I, I think that they were going to lose share to this moment. Um, so congratulations to Buddy Media for selling. Great exit for the founders. Um, I really like that company, like what they've done, so it's great stuff for them. But again, this moment uh, is a startup. They just got another round of funding, so that's going to be uh, another company, company that we're going to watch skyrocket to the top of the charts. Millennial Media is another hot company in that, in that space. I mean, a little different. But yeah, well, Millennial, we follow when they were startup. Now they're public company. They're the number one independent uh, ad firm for mobile and uh, rank two globally behind Google. And so, you know, they're powering the largest mobile campaigns, install apps, et cetera, uh, for mobile and great, great success story about the entrepreneurship. But again- These are not household names. They're coming out of nowhere and they're getting, you know, billion dollar valuations. It's yeah, I mean, and Facebook obviously now growing up, they're public, um, but the, the challenging of the status quo really is about the disruption. So to me, IBM is vulnerable in this area. So the news that we're talking about today in context to IBM is interesting because IBM has legacy. I, I said, I used the word legacy early in the, in the cube this morning. Boy, the IBM executive was like, you can just see like, oh no, no, we don't use that word. Legacy is a fact, legacy is legacy, whether it's kind of viewed as negative uh, to IBM. I think that they don't want that term because it kind of has a negative. Why do you, now why do you say IBM's vulnerable? In what sense? Well, they have incumbent solutions, data warehousing, so the customer base is moving everything over to lower cost, uh, higher performance with open source. So for example, um, it's, although it's not ready for prime time, um, batch processing going real time with Hadoop challenges the solutions for filing, data warehouse, and business intelligence. So you could do the same functionality with a lower cost solution with Hadoop using open source. That's the trend in the open source with Hadoop. So that challenges IBM, so IBM is vulnerable there. So I think if, if, if IBM's vulnerable, John, I think it's the, the, the vulnerability is organizational because I think the IBM's combination of cash on the balance sheet and R&D gives it a leg up. I think IBM's biggest challenge is it can't move fast enough. Well, I didn't say IBM's weak. I said IBM's vulnerable, like all the incumbents. But here's what, how I see it. EMC, under Pat Gelsinger's leadership, is doing a fantastic job in this regard, and I see IBM doing the same thing with their portfolio messages. They are absolutely setting the stake in the ground to their customers that we are doing big data, we are cloud, we are the store for you. We can solve your problems. That's a really new approach, and that's the right one, because what that's going to do is give the comfort to the customer that, look at no matter what the alternatives are, we can do it for you in a reliable way. Yeah, there might be some projects that are done with open source that's kind of like non-core um, activities and, and still has a chance. It's not going to kill open source. They're not going to kill it. They're going to just establish their leadership by using cross-functional tools. Well, like and analytics. IBM's been very active in open source. I mean, yeah. years ago, Steve Mills said, I'm going to invest a billion dollars in open source. And of course, it was a a fight against Microsoft, but it, it's paid off in other ways. At what the end of the day, customers have a choice where to buy stuff, Dave, right? So like, public cloud is a great example, private cloud, which vendor can serve you best? 
And that's what customers are looking at. Is IBM the best vendor for me? And the answer is, in most cases, it might be yes. Or are they strategic? Or, or just like going on the Cube. <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever got fired for going on the Cube, and nobody ever got fired yeah, for yeah. buying IBM. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so we got to wrap. Um, this is SiliconAngle.tv's The Cube. We're live from IBM Edge. We're in Orlando. Uh, I'm Dave Vellante. I'm here with John Furrier, and uh, we'll be right back after this word.